really good to see you here this afternoon. The Lord be pleased uh, to mightily bless us. Now, it is vital to emphasise the importance of preaching in the Protestant Reformation. Thomas Bilney has been described as the Reformation's first important evangelist. So we immediately begin to see that the Reformation was not just about the church establishing right doctrine. It was also about proclaiming Christ to those who are lost in sin and unbelief. And we can look at the Reformation and see that one of the outcomes of it is the establishment of the primacy of preaching in the life of the church. And in particular, of course, preaching the gospel. Now, in 1519, uh, Thomas Bilney was ordained uh, by the Bishop of Ely. Uh, and in 1520, he became fellow of Trinity Hall at Cambridge University. Far more significantly, however, it was in 1519 that Bilney was brought to a personal saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This happened as he was reading the New Testament produced by Erasmus from the Netherlands. And this New Testament uh, took the format of parallel texts in Greek and Latin. It had first been produced in 1516 uh, and a second edition appeared in 1590. Uh, now, Erasmus would have shunned any identification uh, with the early Protestant reformers. But he was nevertheless a, a fine example of what is known as Renaissance humanism in his scholarship and his desire to study original sources. And in God's providence, his Greek New Testament uh, was highly significant uh, in the development of the thinking of the reformers. Bilney had been labouring under deep conviction of sin. But the clergy of the day were simply unable to show him the way of peace. They advised him <coughs> to engage in various acts of penance, in fasting, saying masses, and even paying money for the pardon of sins. Bilney did all that the Roman Catholic Church asked of him. But peace never came to his heart. However, as he read the New Testament of Erasmus, in both Greek and Latin, the Holy Spirit began to speak to him. Mm. And there was one verse in particular which was instrumental in his coming to the Saviour. It was 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Mm. Bilney said of this verse, <coughs> Through God's instruction and inward working, it did so exhilarate 
my heart. Before being wounded with the guilt of my sins. And being almost in despair. But I immediately felt a marvellous comfort and quietness on reading this verse. In so much that my bruised bones leapt for joy. Now, Bill Nee was actually taking a risk by reading Erasmus's work because the university authorities had forbidden it being brought onto college premises by any means. Now, Bill Nee's basic nature was to be shy and retiring. But as the gospel began to take hold upon him, he longed to share what he had discovered with others. And he came to be particularly gifted in engaging in personal witnessing amongst his various contacts in Cambridge. And by doing this, he had a great influence upon the course of the Reformation, this developing movement generally. Remember, we are speaking of a period very early on when Luther's <coughs> teachings were just beginning to infiltrate into the country. But Bilney, following his conversion, by his witnessing to other people who would in their own rights become very influential people, did enormous good for the cause of the Reformation. Uh, for example, one of those whom he confided in about what had happened to him would actually be a future Archbishop of Canterbury under Elizabeth I, namely Matthew Parker. Another notable figure with whom Bilney had contact uh, was the eminent classics scholar George Stafford, who drew large numbers of students to his lectures. And Stafford was converted to Christ under Bilney's direction. This had a significant impact on Cambridge life because Stafford uh, was a very popular lecturer. Bilney was also instrumental under God of the coming to Christ of a Queen's College student called John Lambert, who went on to be an associate of Thomas Cromwell. Now, Thomas Cromwell was one of the primary instigators of the legal aspects of the English Reformation during Henry VIII's reign. And in 1536, <coughs> Lambert was burned at the stake as a heretic because he rejected the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. Now, it may perhaps cause us to smile somewhat in that a primary seedbed where the ideas behind the English Reformation would first be nurtured was in fact a public house. Located in Cambridge, it was called the White Horse Inn. The church authorities came to view Cambridge 
as a centre for what they deem to be the German heresy, the teachings of Luther. But Bilney was right at the heart of the gatherings at the White Horse Inn to discuss the newly emerging ideas behind the Reformation. The sole authority of scripture, for example. Uh, and particularly significant uh, regarding these uh, meetings at the White Horse Inn were those which took place in 1525 and 1526. Amongst those who would come to these gatherings at the inn was the reformer and martyr Robert Barnes, who also took part in smuggling the Bible in English into the country. Also in attendance at these White Horse Inn meetings would be Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley, Miles Coverdale, and mm. Thomas Cranmer, uh, another future Archbishop and also a martyr. Now, a key church in the initial development of English Protestantism was the small church of St. Edward in Cambridge. This was the church attached to Clare College, where Bilney and Hugh Latimer were located. They and Robert Barnes would be amongst the preachers at this church. And the White Horse Inn was also in the same parish. The meetings for discussion on what the Bible really teaches could have begun as early as 1520. Because there was an official book burning of heretical works, so-called, carried out by the authorities in Cambridge, either late in 1520 or early in 1521. And we also know that the uh, writings uh, of Erasmus and Luther were circulating in England uh, even in 1519. Moving on to May 1521, there took place a more grand public burning of books which set forth the ideas of the early reformers. This took place at St Paul's in London. Cardinal Wolsey, leading nobles and a number of bishops were present at this public burning of this literature. And this brings home to us just how dangerous the climate was for these early pioneers of Reformation thinking. Now, following his conversion, Bilney became more and more diligent as a gospel minister. He visited the sick, not only to attend to their practical needs, but also to show them the way of salvation. He was in this way doing essential pioneering work. And he was therefore a key figure in these early years uh, of uh, the Reformation. Can we get those two? Yeah. Uh, two mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry, now, 
the major factor was Vilney's acceptance of the biblical doctrine of justification by faith. From which, uh, like Luther, Vilney uh, deduced the vanity of a religion based on mere external observances. True Christianity is the religion of the heart. And there are no outward works that anyone can do in order to gain God's favour. Bilney also engaged in much prison visitation to proclaim the gospel. Now the norm for a very long time had been for church leaders to neglect any particular emphasis on the vital importance of Bible-based preaching in the church's ministry to the world. Bilney sought to remedy this situation. In July 1525, he was licensed to preach throughout the Diocese of Ely. But he chose to go to other areas as well. Now, in 1527, even though he had been warned by Cardinal Wolsey to stop preaching, what the authorities regarded as dangerous Lutheran doctrine Bilney began itinerating around the eastern counties of England. His preaching, including attacks upon the corruption of the church of the day. He spoke against praying to the saints. He spoke against the whole notion of purgatory. The practice of ascribing miraculous powers to relics of saints. He spoke against the veneration of images. His Bible-based preaching was so controversial that on two <coughs> occasions at Christ Church in Ipswich, he was physically pulled out of the pulpit. John Fox tells us that at Hadley in Suffolk, Bilney preached with such success that a great number of that parish became exceeding well learned in the Holy Scriptures. Now this is very interesting. Bilney's preaching also took place in the open air, in the fields of Norfolk. You see, when the gospel is in your heart, you want to proclaim it. Amen. Bilney was actually engaged in itinerant preaching when he was arrested in November 1527. This again is surely significant. He was travelling, he was making known publicly biblical truth. He was not arrested as he was writing a scholarly paper in his study. But as he was out in the highways, and byways proclaiming Jesus Christ and his great salvation. He was again summoned to appear before Cardinal Wolsey at Westminster. This happened on November the 29th, 1527. Wolsey was joined by Bishop Tunstall of London and Sir Thomas More. He went through lengthy cross-examination over many days. 
There were witnesses present who willingly testified against him as being a heretic. Now, we must remember the point previously made that Bilney was, by nature, a very quiet and retiring individual. And under all the pressure created by this summons before the church authorities, he very sadly agreed publicly to denounce Luther's teachings. This was primarily because at this stage he did not have enough light to agree with Martin Luther about the necessity of separation from the Roman Catholic Church. To Bilney, there was simply one true church. Which, of course, is correct in terms of the true body of Christ comprising those saved by grace alone. But this is not true concerning any human institution called a church. So, despite this most regrettable public rejection of the German reformer by Vilney, he still remained in deep trouble with the authorities, refusing to withdraw all that he himself had been teaching. He continued to deny, for example, Mary's perpetual virginity and the intercession of departed saints such as Peter and Mary on, on behalf of God's people. He knew that the Lord Jesus Christ is our only mediator and advocate with the Father. So he was being held in prison. His life was still in danger on the charge of heresy. And increasing pressure was placed upon him to recant all that he had been preaching against the church. He asked to call witnesses in his support, but this was not permitted. However, friends were allowed to come and visit him in prison. Now, the case was put to him by his friends that he would be throwing his life away to no purpose if he refused to recant. There was so much more, they argued, that he could achieve for Christ's sake by staying alive and continuing the work which he had been doing. And so he was influenced by these arguments from his friends. He was also mentally and physically exhausted. And with the extended nature of the cross-examinations which he had to undergo, he tragically and finally chose publicly to recount all that he had ever preached. He admitted that he had been guilty of heresy. He did this on December the 7th, 1527. He was then marched through the streets of London in a public act of humiliation. He was kept in prison for a further year. only being released either late 1528 or early 1529. The time in prison was a time of deep, deep darkness and despair for him. And even when he was finally released, he continued in deep 
depression for another year. So much so that his friends were fearful of his being left on his own. Bilney knew that he had denied the truths of God's word. He was profoundly convicted. So we must endeavour not to be too hard on him for his act of recantation. In these early pioneering days of the Reformation, he simply did not understand it yet that there was any other way of faithfully serving God other than through the church of which he was a part. To imagine that the church itself could be the enemy of the gospel was simply beyond the light which he had so far received. Now, of course, because of the labours of those who have gone before us, we understand fully today that churches can indeed be the enemies of the gospel. Mm. Some of the worst enemies, actually. Mm. However, gradually, by God's grace, light and peace did finally return to Thomas Bilney. He slowly began to accept that he had done what he had done. But that God was also merciful. He continued studying the scriptures for some months. He started having regular meetings once again with Hugh Latimer and others. He also re-engaged in the task of visiting the sick. With the appointment of Sir Thomas More as Lord Chancellor and Bishop Stokesley as Bishop of London, the danger to those who were drawn to the teachings of Luther and a more biblical outlook suddenly began to increase greatly. Both More and Stokesley had a much severer attitude to the alleged heretics and their predecessors, Cardinal Wolsey and Bishop Tunstall. So it was now becoming a more vicious environment for those who believed the scriptures. This drew those attending the meetings at the White Horse Inn into a deeper fellowship with one another. And this more intense level of danger from the authorities may actually have been used by the Lord to strengthen Bilney's own personal resolve. Now another factor may have been the increasing effect and stir in Cambridge and beyond, which Latimer's preaching was now having. In a wonderful indication of his being restored to his walk with the Lord, early in 1531, Bilney left Cambridge and resumed his preaching, both privately and public. He had with him a copy of William Tyndale's New Testament in English. This was a banned book. He began to preach in the fields and in the meadows once more. 
bearing testimony to the faith which he had previously renounced. It was now only a matter of time, and he knew it, <clears throat> before he would be arrested again for heresy. He also travelled to London, where Latimer was preaching, despite the hostility of Bishop Stokesley. And then returning to Norfolk, Bilney was, sure enough, arrested and imprisoned once more as a relapsed heretic. And he would soon be burnt at the stake in that same year. <coughs> Bill Nick was no more than about 36 years of age. But what a great and influential pioneer of Reformation teaching he had been in that short life and in the movement's early days. And we must note that Bilney's impact most definitely included his public preaching. The truth of Jesus Christ and his gospel of salvation cannot be hidden. It must be publicly proclaimed. Our Lord told the disciples in Matthew 10 and verse 27, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Now, we referred earlier to the enormous influence which Bilney had by means of his personal witnessing to his own contacts. Now perhaps the most significant figure amongst all those who heard Bilney's testimony was Hugh Latimer. By God's grace, it was Bilney who led Latimer to Christ in 1524. Bilney did so by describing to Latimer his own personal conversion experience. When Latimer heard Bilney's testimony, it greatly disarmed him and utterly humbled him. It was the last thing he was expecting. Now, thinking of Latimer, again just setting some historical background, he was born about 1485. He became a fellow of Clare Hall in Cambridge in 1509. Now, in the late 1510s and 1520s, his academic abilities began more and more to shine forth. He became university preacher and chaplain at Cambridge in 1522, at what was still a relatively young age. For such a position of no little importance and influence. Now, at this stage in Latimer's life, he was using his many skills to defend the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church in its utterly unreformed state. Indeed, Latimer had obtained his divinity degree precisely on the grounds of his scholarly attack on Melanchthon, Luther's associate in Germany. 
However, Latimer said of Bill Nees witnessing to him that it made him learn far more spiritual truth than he had been able to acquire up to then over many years. The simple testimony of a humble believer saved by grace had more effect on Latimer than all his scholarly study over many years. Now it needed enormous humility for Latimer to confess that. But he did. And it demonstrates how the Holy Spirit was powerfully at work when Bilney witnessed to him. Now, after his conversion in 1524, and uh, in, in, interestingly, um, this is the 500th anniversary this year of Latimer's um, conversion. After his conversion, uh, he begins attending the White Horse Inn meetings. And uh, all those interested in the new ideas of the Reformation uh, were at these meetings. Latimer joined Bilney in visiting the sick and those in prison in Cambridge. He commenced preaching in the university pulpits in a style hitherto unknown in Cambridge. Latimer soon became famous as one of the most striking and powerful preachers of the day. He stirred up hundreds of his hearers to search the scriptures and inquire after the way of salvation. Now, there was a man called Thomas Beacon, B-E-C-O-N, who would later become chaplain to Thomas Cranmer. He was converted under Latimer's ministry. <clears throat> Beacon wrote concerning Latimer's preaching, none except the stiff necked went away from it without being affected with a high detestation of sin and moved unto all godliness and virtue. Now, interestingly, Thomas Beacon was the very first Englishman ever to campaign for schools to be set up for the education of girls. The stance of the reformers, with their strong emphasis on all the people being able to read the Bible for themselves in their own tongue, inevitably led to the embracing of the notion of proper education being necessary for all. Now, Latimer often preached at St. Edward's Church in Cambridge, but he went further afield as well. He received opposition from the Bishop of Ely for his attacks upon orthodox teachings and practices. But Cardinal Wolsey, though he was no friend of the reformers, liked Latimer's style and even gave him license to preach throughout the country. You see, God can use those who are not his to further his purposes. Now, many people tell us today but the only reason the English Reformation took place was because a wicked and lustful king wanted a divorce. Nothing could be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. 
The Reformation took place because there was a rediscovery of the absolute authority of the Word of God, the Bible. That's why the Reformation took place. Now, Latimer became rector of the parish of West Kington in Wiltshire. And he was appointed as Bishop of Worcester in 1535. In 1536, Cranmer asked him to preach in front of the convocation of the clergy. An amazing opportunity to exercise real influence. And when doing so, Latimer spoke of the urgent need for the church to be reformed. And he spoke against various disreputable practices, such as the veneration of relics, the worship of images, bogus miracles and the sale of masses. So the doctrines of the reformers were making some headway. And interestingly, in what is known as the Bishop's Book of 1537, a creedal exposition of the teachings of the then church in England, the following admirable statement was made. And remember, we're, we're talking about the Roman Catholic Church at this time. But this is what was stated in the Bishop's Book. The office of preaching is the chief and most principal office whereunto priests or bishops be called. In other words, the primacy of preaching was now being asserted, even at this very early stage of the development of the Reformation. And so, thanks to the influence of the early reformers, there was an increasing awareness that the ministers or bishops' fundamental role was not as an administrator, nor was it as a priest offering up sacrifices <coughs> at an altar. It is as a preacher of the word of God. That is his primary task. Yeah. However, of course, there was a strong reaction welling up against the reforming influences. Henry VIII had indeed broken with papal supremacy, papal authority over the English church. But that does not mean that Henry began to embrace Reformation teachings. Far from it. Henry VIII remained thoroughly Catholic in his doctrine including accepting the error of transubstantiation. In 1539, Henry had much personal input in causing the Six Articles Act to come onto the statute book, the purpose of which was to enforce key Roman Catholic teachings with severe penalties for non Compliance. For example, the Six Articles Act uh, upheld the practice of auricular confession to a priest, the celibacy of the priesthood, and decreed that any denial of transubstantiation would incur the death penalty by burning. That was Henry. The eighth, in 1537. Now Latimer, of course, felt that he had to oppose the Six Articles Act. As a result, he was made to resign his bishopric, and he was imprisoned. He was also again imprisoned 
towards the end of Henry's reign in 1546. But this tells us that right up to the end, Henry VIII was jailing those who upheld the doctrinal principles of the Protestant Reformation. Therefore, in the 1530s and 1540s, as long as Henry was on the throne, the teachings of Roman Catholicism continued to be the national religion. Despite the king's dissolution of the monasteries and despite his formal break with papal authority. Now, Latimer was released from prison upon the accession of the young Edward VI to the throne in 1547. Latimer's personal calling to preach was so strong that he desired to simply engage in preaching rather than return to his former role of being a bishop. So a pulpit ministry became his priority, along with open-air preaching, in particular at St Paul's Cross in London where large numbers of passers-by would listen. He preached, so to speak, where the people were at, having an ability to communicate with the less educated hearers. It could truly be said of him that the common people heard him gladly. His sermons were earnest, witty, lively, and engaging. One contemporary declared, I have an ear for other preachers, but I have a heart for Latimer. Now we read of our Lord in Luke chapter 5. It came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now, Latimer used this incident in our Lord's ministry which he quaintly described as preaching from an old rotten boat, he used it to champion outdoor preaching. He thought that to limit preaching to the church building was superstition. He urged Edward VI to commend any preacher wherever he preached the word of God, whether sitting on a horse or preaching in a tree. He may have got the idea of preaching on horseback uh, from Roland Taylor, one of his chaplains, who did so around the Diocese of Worcester. Now, Latimer's preaching did not draw back from addressing the particular evils of his day. Not in terms of what we today would call the social gospel, which is a heresy, but in terms of applying biblical principles mm -hmm. to people's conduct, which affected the well-being of others especially the poorer classes. He would therefore often denounce covetousness amongst landlords. He denounced whatever was adversely affecting others in society. Now on 
15th of January, 1548, Latimer preached his renowned sermon called the Sermon on the Plough. It appealed to the nation's bishops to focus on the primary task of the Christian ministry, namely to preach the gospel. Criticising strongly those prelates who neglected the task. Liking the preacher's work to that of a ploughman who prepares the ground and makes it fit for growth, Latimer declared that a Christian minister, and therefore not least each bishop, must bring his hearers to a faith that embraces Jesus Christ and trusts to his merit, a lively faith, a justifying faith, a faith that makes a man righteous without respect of works. Latimer advocated, casting the hearers down with the power of the law and with the threatenings of God, and then reaching them up again with the gospel. Now, the boy king, Edward VI, was most favourable, by God's grace, towards the Reformation. And so in God's providence, Latimer had much opportunity to preach in front of the king and the royal court. What a national blessing to have gospel preaching in front of the head of state. Mm -hmm. Can I suggest we've not had that in this country for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. I wonder if King Charles has ever heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. Or he would have heard from the leaders of the national church as a diet of trendy cultural Marxism. That's all he will have heard. Now, of course, 1553, the ardently Roman Catholic Queen Mary came to the throne. Latimer was quickly imprisoned in the Tower of London. He knew six hours before his arrest that it was about to happen, but he chose not to flee. His attitude was, I have declared God's word to two former kings and I will now do so to the current queen. Now Latimer was now around 70 years of age. He was inevitably found guilty of heresy. He was burnt at the stake alongside Nicholas Ridley on October the 16th, 1655. On this day, before being tied to their stakes, Latimer and Ridley embraced one another. Ridley said these words to Latimer. Be of good cheer, brother, for God will either assuage the fury of the flames or else strengthen us to abide it. An iron chain was then bound around Latimer and Ridley's midriffs. They were fastened to the same stake. As a light, a light was applied to the faggots around Ridley's body. Latter then uttered the following very famous words. Be of good comfort, Brother Ridley. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. Amen. 
It will be put out unless we do what we have to do in our own day. Amen. Amen. And go into the public places declaring Jesus Christ crucified for sinners. Latimer's ministry shows us that the primary call of any minister in Christ's church is to preach the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on behalf of sinful men. Mm -hmm. And this does not mean just preaching in a church pulpit. When the Holy Spirit is leading a man into the Christian ministry, it is a leading to be a preacher, an expander of God's word, our only authority. The minister's calling is a constraint to make Christ known to as many people as possible through preaching. The minister in Christ church should be able to say, with the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 6, Necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. The word of God itself specifically focuses upon preaching as the primary instrument to bring sinners to Christ. Romans 10 Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Latimer's preaching focused upon the problem of sin in the lives of men. It focused on the need for righteousness before the Holy God. Its emphasis was on ministering to the lost. He knew that bringing sinners to the Saviour was his task above everything else. Now in the book of Proverbs, we see the personification of wisdom. And this personification actually refers to the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Proverbs 1 and verse 20, we are told this. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gate. In the city she uttereth her words. So there we are told that the ministry of the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, to a lost world is to be seen as in particular taking place in all those public areas where people gather together. Amen. The chief place of concourse, mm -hmm. the opening of the gates in the city. If we wish to see a true turning back to God in our nation, it can only be through going into the public places and speaking of the universality of sin and of the need to flee from the wrath to come. Our priority is to explain biblical truth to those who have not the slightest comprehension of the most basic reality concerning the nature of man. Namely that all without exception are governed and controlled by hearts which are corrupted and polluted by nature. We have to tell people that they need new hearts.
In other words, we have to tell people, ye must be born again. All need to come in repentance and faith to Jesus Christ, who makes all things new. Now concerning Hugh Latimer's uh, preaching, Bishop Ryle made the following assessment. Few probably have ever addressed an English congregation with more effect than he did. If a combination of sound gospel doctrine, plain Saxon language, boldness, liveliness, directness and simplicity can make a preacher few I suspect have ever equaled old Latimer. That was Ryle's assessment. And let us note two of those characteristics in particular. Boldness and directness. These are essential elements in true gospel preaching. We must never be tempted to fashion our message to comply with the spirit of the age. Or in order to avoid upsetting anyone too much. <laughs> now this is more subtle. We must never resort to the device of, in inverted commas, just preaching the gospel. And by that, always deliberately avoiding any actual mention of the prevailing sins of our time. That's not gospel preaching. No. Amen. We, of course, never focus exclusively on any one sin. We never seek to offend simply for its own sake. However, it would be an absolute dereliction of duty if we made a point of never referring to the most fashionable and prevailing sins of our present time. Now, in God's providence, as we have said, Latimer had opportunity to preach before two kings, Henry VIII and Edward VI. He refused to preach when doing so in any different way than when preaching to the common people. He knew that God was his judge. And he has an infinitely greater authority than that earthly king before him. Latimer knew he could not compromise upon the plain declaration of God's word. <clears throat> this is telling us that today Christian preachers must be prepared to confront the government of the day yes. mm -hmm. if that government is defying the laws of God. Yes. It's not getting involved in politics. It's upholding God's truth. Latimer referred to the high calling of preaching like this. It is the office of salvation and the office of regeneration. Take away preaching and you take away salvation. This office is the ordinary way that God hath appointed to save us all. Preaching is the thing that the devil wrestles most against. Amen. So Latimer rightly perceived that it is through the instrumentality of preaching that men are born again and saved. It is not through music. It's not through entertainment. It's not through pursuing cultural 
relevant. Oh, Lord, protect us from that. <laughs> it is not through social work and community involvement without any gospel message. Men are born again and saved by the authoritative proclamation of God's word. Primarily by men called directly by God to do so, but also, of course, including the personal testimony by any true Christian to his or her neighbour about Christ being the only saviour of sinners. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Amen. The Christian message of universal sinfulness, salvation from hell through a saviour who died on the cross, does not in the least way accord with human wisdom. Nevertheless, it is the message which we are commanded to proclaim. As we earnestly desire to see a revival in our own darkened nation today, it must be by means of the authoritative proclamation of men's urgent need to repent of sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only Saviour. May the Lord raise up in our own time earnest preachers whose steely resolve is that of the Apostle Paul. I determine not to know anything among you, say Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. 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 Amen.